Um, the next speaker is a hero of mine. I have used a lot of his slides. Uh, he's done excellent work with two big names in this field, Dr. Ravenskov and Dr. Malcolm Kendrick, uh, the authors of the cholesterol, the great cholesterol con. He's a neuroscientist. He brings a unique perspective to cholesterol, uh, looking from the outside. And I think listening to people like him, the changes in cholesterol guidelines are not going to come from the top down. It's going to come from grassroots movement, from people like you saying that, this is what I have learned. And my doctor, you should have a different perspective on cholesterol and cholesterol drugs. So uh, without further ado, David Diamond. Thank you, Nadir, for that introduction and for inviting me to speak at the meeting. Thanks, everybody, also for coming out of this ungodly early hour. <laughs> uh, I hope I'll make it worth your while. Uh, so let's start with uh, my disclosures. Uh, first, as uh, Nadir said, I'm a, a neuroscientist. I'm celebrating now 40 years as a neuroscientist, beginning in 1978. Um, I have decades of service to the VA, just retired as a career scientist, where my primary work is on PTSD to help develop medications to help people with PTSD. I've been funded by a variety of different federal agencies, I still have funding and doing neuroscience research funded by NIH as well as drug companies to develop medication uh, for people with PTSD, also on the science advisory board of Kigenics. But I'm not presenting any of that work today. I'll give you a disclosure that's more important and more relevant to my talk today, and that is something very personal. And here you are looking at actually my blood lipids and the likelihood that I would have a heart attack going back to 2007. I was diagnosed with a genetic disorder, familial hypertriglyceridemia, which meant I had astronomically high triglycerides. You'd like for your triglycerides to be below 100. Uh, I went for years with my triglycerides over 700, um, and abysmally low HDL as well. So my doctor sat me down and told me about my high risk for developing a heart attack. And here you see in this study, you put the numbers together, and I had about more than a 15 times greater risk of developing a heart attack as a result of my abnormal lipids. Um, and in fact, my story in detail is available, thank you, Andreas, at Diet Doctor, um, in which there was a moment in 2007 when my doctor sat me down and he said, as the commercial is, diet, low-fat diet, I followed the American Heart Association diet, and exercise have not worked. You must go on a statin. You have such a high likelihood of developing a heart attack in the next 10 years. Well, I've made it 10 years. <laughs> um, and what I decided at that time was, uh, well, I've got a PhD in biology. The least I can do is just read a bit about the science. I didn't even know what a triglyceride was. I knew a lot about the brain, but I knew nothing about heart disease. So I started reading about the triglycerides. I decided rather than going to the pharmacy, I would go to the library. So I read a few papers, and those few papers have now developed into a few thousand papers. So I have a separate career development area in which I now study cardiovascular disease. And so what I can share with you, I've learned over the last 10 years, in which we have at this meeting, which is summarized so well in this cartoon, so as the doctor is saying to the woman, you went on Atkins, you lost weight, you lowered your cholesterol, you cured your blood pressure, you're so much more healthy, um, but the diet is bad for your health. So you have all these improvement in your biomarkers, but you're going to die. You're just going to leave a thinner corpse as a result of going on low-carb diet. <laughs> Even more important, you notice that the cartoonist has you've lowered your cholesterol, because everyone assumes that if you want a good direction with diet, you'll lower your cholesterol. Everybody knows that. So in fact, the fear, which we heard pervasive yesterday, is the low-carb diet can increase LDL, and so you're going to be healthier and you're going to have a heart attack. So this is so consistent. We heard this throughout the talks yesterday. We'll hear it throughout the talks probably today. Um, and so that's what I'm going to address, the fear of LDL as causation for heart disease. And so this cartoon seems a bit harsh, 
but it actually represents the pervasive feeling in the, in the area of cardiovascular disease and the influence of food and drug companies to have an effect on how we think about cholesterol. So leaders of the field have been paid very well to put forth this idea that cholesterol causes heart disease, and the medical community has gone along with this very much sheep-like. And so this diet heart hypothesis, which began just as someone's idea in the 1950s, that you consume saturated animal fat, it'll increase your LDL, it'll cause you to have heart disease, doesn't even deserve now the title of hypothesis, which is why I put it as a myth in my title. So what I'm going to cover in my talk, first of all, is that there has been an explicit campaign to promote the incorrect idea that cholesterol causes heart disease, cardiovascular disease, which began as total cholesterol, that failed, it then developed into LDLC, which actually failed as a causative factor in heart disease, which now has evolved into LDLP. All of this has failed to explain the cause of heart disease. I will then talk about how the pharmacological reduction of cholesterol has been supported by deceptive approaches, deceptive statistical approaches, as well as fraud in this area. And I won't leave you in the lurch. If I'm going to leave cholesterol, then I'm going to share with you actually what is it that actually causes heart disease. So we look at the point in which LDL actually became the cause of heart disease, in which it was actually found guilty of causing heart disease. And there was an explicit moment in time, 1984, in which Brown and Goldstein, who won the Nobel Prize for their work on the LDL receptor, basically stated it as a fact that LDL causes heart disease. And so the problem at that time was there had been decades of research that had failed to conclusively show that cholesterol in general, LDL, actually cause heart disease. So there was a need in the 1980s to confirm that LDL causes heart disease, or at the very least, cholesterol causes heart disease. So there is a powerful, influential finding from the Mr. Fit work in which hundreds of thousands of men were followed for many years, and they looked at the relation between total cholesterol and heart disease. This is still a study that is cited as evidence that cholesterol causes heart disease. And this is a frightening graph because this shows the relation of death from heart disease to cholesterol level in red. And so what you're looking at here is the reference at the left shows the rate of heart disease with the people with the lowest cholesterol at 150. And so what you find here they're emphasizing is any small increase in cholesterol increases your risk of dying from heart disease. So here from 1.0 to be a 2.0 means you have twice the risk of dying. 3.0, three times the risk. So as your cholesterol rises, you're dramatically increasing the risk of dying from heart disease based on your total cholesterol level. So any small increase in cholesterol will increase your risk of dying from heart disease. So I looked at this, and in fact, here they are concluding the great majority of middle-aged men are at risk of dying of heart disease with any increase in cholesterol. So I looked at this study and actually looked at the real data. So here we're looking at a ratio. So we're going to look at this study and look at the raw data, the actual percent of men that actually had a heart attack and died. So what I'm going to graph in blue are the percent of people that did not die of coronary heart disease based on their cholesterol level. And that is in blue. <laughs> and so it's the same raw data, this will amaze you, the same raw data generated the bars in red and the bars in blue. And you were looking at the percent of people that did not die in blue. And I'll make this a little easier for you. I'll go draw on a line. That line is across 99% in which virtually all the men did not die of heart disease. So that line is at 99%. So how can you go from the blue to the red? Well, here are the actual findings. So 0.3% died of coronary heart disease at the lowest level of cholesterol and 1.3% died of heart disease. A difference of 1% across the entire physiological range of cholesterol. And yet they could convert this to something that was so frightening. Well, how did they do that? 
Well, if you take 1.3% at the most extreme point and divide it by 0.3, you end up with 4.13, and that's the data on the left side. That's how you can tell people you have a 400% chance of dying of heart disease by dividing by that minuscule number. But the real difference was 1%. And why did Stamler do this? He did this because the cholesterol theory was failing and this was a way to, to resuscitate it. And this is just one of the deceptive practices that have been used in this field to promote the idea that cholesterol causes heart disease. And this was just total cholesterol. But now let's go to the highest level of cholesterol. Understand something. These are people who would be diagnosed with familial hypercholesterolemia. Having extremely high cholesterol over 300 is considered dangerous. You must go on a statin if your cholesterol is over 300. And yet, about 99% of the people did not die of heart disease, despite having extremely high cholesterol. So let's actually look at this disease and see, is this different? Are these people at high risk of developing heart disease? So this is a hypercholesterolemia. Here's a paper from the 1950s in which you see people with high cholesterol are predisposed to develop atherosclerosis and die at a younger age. And here you can see an image in which cholesterol is found in the middle of the artery. High cholesterol, cholesterol is in the artery, clearly one causes the other. So as a scientist, I just ask a couple of simple questions to test the hypothesis, that there should be a reduction in lifespan in people diagnosed with FH, they should die young, which is what you're taught in medical school. And that a pharmacological reduction of cholesterol should improve outcomes and should enhance lifespan. So I started looking at the papers. And this is one of the first ones that I came across. One of the largest studies on people with FH, ancient study, 1966, very important journal, medicine, and they're looking at the thousands of people who are diagnosed with FH, and what do they find? No evidence that people with FH actually have a shorter lifespan. In fact, you find it's routine. These people with cholesterol, that's three, four, 500, are living normally into their seventh and eighth decades without heart disease. This makes no sense if you're thinking that cholesterol, whether it's LDL or total cholesterol, is causing you to die young. And now the more modern studies, you have a genetic determination of people that have familial hypercholesterolemia. And so that's not an anomalous study. We now look at people currently living, there's a great thing in Norway in which you've got socialized medicine, you can follow everybody, look at all their medication, look at lifespan. And so this study looked at that over a couple of decades. These again are people that have astronomically high cholesterol. And you look at their rate of death over the lifespan. And what you find is there is a slight increase in the rate of death early in life in the first few decades. But it is such a small percentage of these people that it is not statistically significant. Overall, for the population diagnosed with FH, confirmed genetically, that is not an actual increase in death. So the people with FH are not dying at a higher rate early on. And in fact, when you look over the lifespan, what you actually have is a reduced rate of death in those people diagnosed with FH in their 70s. What this means is if you have been diagnosed with FH and you are 70 years of age and your cholesterol is 400 and your LDL is 250, that you're actually healthier than other 70 year olds with ideal cholesterol. You have a lower rate of death in your 70s and overall there's a lower rate of lifetime death for people who have familial hypercholesterolemia. This is not fit at all with the idea that having astronomically high cholesterol will kill you young. And the authors actually stated very explicitly, there were no difference in all-cause mortality in these patients, except that the people from 70 to 79 actually had a lower rate of death. And this is very straightforward. The people who have the highest cholesterol have dramatically less cancer, dramatically less infectious disease, and overall have average rate of cardiovascular disease. People in their 70s and 80s with high levels of cholesterol are healthier than those with low levels of cholesterol. Now, we can also look just broadly at populations at longitudinal studies. Here's a study of uh, 20 years, over 20 years, in which you look at cholesterol levels and follow people over the decades. And these are older people in the prime time in which you're going to have a heart attack or die of a stroke, 70s to the 90s. And what did they find? Increased mortality in those people with low cholesterol. 
Having low cholesterol is unhealthy. Having high cholesterol actually enables you to be healthier and to live longer. And, and I just love their interpretation <laughs> in which they say, it's just so, there's a candor about this. We have been unable to explain our results. <laughs> Everybody told us cholesterol is supposed to kill you, and yet these people are so darn healthy. Uh, but in fact, they actually, in their discussion, they reviewed the literature and said, in fact, their findings are consistent with so many other longitudinal studies that show as you age, in fact, having higher cholesterol enables you to be healthier and to live longer. Um, and just because I don't have time to go over the entire literature, I've now worked with over a, a dozen outstanding clinician scientists, actually led by uh, Dr. Ufi Ravenskov, in which a couple of years ago, we reviewed the entire literature on LDL cholesterol and mortality. We did not find a single paper that showed that people with high LDL actually die younger. And in fact, in every paper, either the mortality rate was equivalent or the people with the highest LDL lived longer and were healthier than those with lower cholesterol. And our conclusion was elderly people with high LDL live as long or longer than those with low cholesterol. So there is reason to question the validity of the cholesterol hypothesis, that is, that cholesterol actually causes heart disease. And more recently, our group has come out even more sternly and forcibly to make the point, as we have in the title of our paper we just published this year, an expert review of clinical pharmacology, LDLC does not cause cardiovascular disease. We could not make it more explicit to state it as a fact to go against what's supposedly conventional wisdom is not wisdom at all. And so in our table, here is a quote in our paper, cholesterol hypothesis does not, uh, is not consistent, does not satisfy any criteria for causality. This theory has been maintained by misleading statistics, exclusion of unsuccessful trials, and what the leaders of the field have done, they have ignored contradictory findings. So, if LDL-C doesn't work, and now pretty much people are accepting, LDL-C doesn't work. It doesn't explain, actually, um, heart disease. Total cholesterol has been abandoned now for decades as a cause of heart disease. And the latest fad is, well, they've escaped from LDL-C, and now what we're looking at is LDL-P, the particles. So, I like the way Dave Feldman puts it, that basically, you've got all the passengers on all the cars, and all the passengers will be the total cholesterol, that will be the LDLC. So instead, what we're looking at is something about the number of cars, the number of LDL particles. That's what actually kills you. That's what causes heart disease. That's the latest fad. So here's one way to look at this. What you've got is the rate of coronary events in three populations. The one in red, they have more events compared to the extreme in blue. Now, these people actually have lower LDLC than those people here in blue that have fewer events in which they have higher LDLC. So they're saying, well, it's not LDLC, it's the number of particles. So these people actually have more particles than those down here. So it's the particles that will kill you. So let's look more closely at this study and at the people. So I've expressed the data as a percentage of the LDLP compared to the people with high LDLP compared to those with low LDLP. And so what you've got here is those that have high LDLP, which means they have more coronary events, they had about 25% more LDLP compared to those with the low. And those people had actually less LDLC. So I've taken the data from the last graph and just converted it. So you're comparing those with LD, high LDLP to those with low LDLP. So let's actually look at these people and what's different about those that have high LDLP versus low LDLP. Well, there's a lot. And so when you look at these people that have the high LDL P compared to the low LDL people, they're vastly different. I mean, the first is they have about 25% lower HDL. And HDL is called the good cholesterol because having more of it is associated with less heart disease. And also higher blood sugar is associated with lower HDL. And so they've got lower HDL. And when you look at the incidence of diabetes, there's more than twice the rate of diabetes in those as type 2 diabetes and those that have the high LDLP. 
and look at all the markers. Those that have metabolic syndrome, 25% higher. Their triglycerides are about 60% higher, along with higher LDLP. And you got 25% more smokers and significantly higher, 60% higher HOMA IR, in which is greater insulin re resistance. So there's reduced insulin sensitivity. And so ultimately what we're really looking at is now LDLP is simply a marker for an unhealthy lifestyle. This is another reason why you can look at whether it's total cholesterol, LDLC. This is not evidence that LDLP causes heart disease. What you find is more LDLP in people who have an unhealthy lifestyle. It is simply a surrogate marker. This is not evidence that LDL in any way, shape or form, whether it's small or dense, LDLP, LDLC, there is no evidence that LDL in any form causes heart disease. And so over the decades, there have been numerous studies now in terms of lowering LDL. Since I've presented the evidence to you now that LDL doesn't cause heart disease, and so the studies you will find have almost no effect on lowering LDL as far as heart disease outcome. It's a little bit like saying to someone who's a smoker, well, if you switch from holding your cigarette with your right hand to your left hand, well, then we'll reduce the incidence of lung cancer in you. Okay? It's about that effective. When you think about LDL is not involved in causing heart disease, you're not going to expect, therefore, any benefit by lowering LDL. So in other talks, I've covered some of the older work, such as there's a bioresin to reduce LDL. It's called styramine. That trial failed. Um, but we'll go to some of the more modern work, the statins, which everybody is enamored with, the wonder drugs, which reduce LDL by blocking the HMG-CoA reductase enzyme. But we also have perhaps one of the best kept secrets in all the cardiovascular research, and that is there's another category of drugs that's been studied extensively over the past couple of decades, and they're called CETP inhibitors. And what they do is interfere with the conversion of HDL into LDL, therefore increasing your levels of HDL, that's the good cholesterol, and dramatically decreasing LDL. It's actually better than statins, the CETP inhibitors, and chances are almost nobody in this room has heard of the CETP inhibitors. The reason why I haven't heard about them is they completely failed. And so I'm showing you this news report rather than show you every single study. Tens of thousands of people have been given the CETP inhibitors. It dramatically increases HDL, dramatically lowers the LDL as much as the statins. And as this, new, as this study shows, it has completely failed. But you see how it's reported the dangerous kind of, LD, of cholesterol, that's LDL, it, it decreased it and more than doubled the good cholesterol. And right here, it's absolutely a summary of decades of work. Pharmaceutical companies have spent billions of dollars to produce and test the CETP inhibitors, and it has failed miserably. And so Stephen Nichols said, well, it seemed to do all the right things. This is baffling. It's a mind-boggling question as to why it's completely ineffective. It's not mind-boggling. If LDL doesn't cause heart disease, and simply raising HDL with drugs doesn't improve outcomes, well, then you're barking up the wrong cholesterol tree. <laughs> you're barking up the wrong tree, it doesn't work. And that's why these drugs have failed. Ah, but now we go to statins, okay? The wonder drugs, statins. If your cholesterol is high, your doctor's pretty much going to demand that you go on statins. If you have diabetes, you've gotta go on a statin. So let's look at the statins. So I don't have time to go over the broad range of all the studies that have been conducted. And this is one of the, actually one of the best studies, one of the largest effects. And you can see the statin Lipitor. This is what actually propelled Lipitor to generate billions of dollars in revenue for a drug company. And you see here promoted 36%, a dramatic reduction in development of heart disease. You practically feel immune from having a heart attack if you're taking Lipitor. So let's look at this study. Uh, and here it is. So the 36% reduction in heart disease is right here in Lancet. 
in, published in 2003, a highly respected medical journal. And what they're showing is that by reducing cholesterol with uh, atorvastatin or Lipitor, they reduce fatal coronary heart disease, non-fatal MI or heart attack by 36%. Well, let's actually look at the data. I have this annoying habit in which I don't just take the numbers that are in the abstract. I actually look at the data. So here we actually have the data from the study. And the way I like to present it is, what's the likelihood that I will not have an adverse event if I either take the drug or I don't take the drug? So an adverse event, for example, dying. That would be an adverse event. Okay. So not having an adverse event would be survival. What percentage of people survived? And it's basically identical between those who took the drug and those who didn't. And you look across, basically it's almost all identical. And so where is that 36% reduction in coronary events? Well, it's right there. You see that sliver of a difference right there? That is a 36% reduction in events. I kid you not. I'm serious about this. I didn't make this up. So that is a 36% reduction. That's what you saw in the paper. That's what you saw in the ad. So how can that be a 36% reduction? Well, let's look at the actual data. Uh, right, so we go from atorvastatin, which is Lipitor, and we look at placebo. And we look at the actual rate in which adverse events did not occur. The actual difference between the two is 1.1%. So the difference between the rate of adverse events is 1.1%. So let's go back to the ad. How can you say it's 36% when the actual difference is 1.1%? This is where you've got to look at the fine print. So let's look at this ad and expand it a bit. Okay, so did you notice the blue font on the blue background? It says it right there in a large clinical study. 3% taking the placebo had a heart attack compared to 2% taking the Lipitor. They've got it in the ad. I mean, it's probably the lawyers just insisted, you know, you gotta put the real data in the ad somewhere. But let's kinda hide it in the bottom. So I'm not making this stuff up. It's right there in the ad. It's in the paper. The real difference is 1%. So how can it be both 1% and 36% at the same time? So this is what they do. You take that 1.1% and you divide it by 3%. 3% being the rate of coronary events in the placebo group. Why? For absolutely no reason whatsoever other than the fact that you can then distort the data. You then get to say, we've reduced the incidence of events by 36%. So, so I love this little guy. <laughs> this little guy is say, hey, I wasn't born yesterday, right? But, but I had to tell you, I. I was at the VA and I gave grand rounds lectures to the doctors there. I've been to cardiology meetings and I've presented this and I give this lecture to the public and I get that look. It's like, come on now, seriously? They are allowed to get away with that? Yes, they are allowed to get away with that because obviously you're not gonna buy a product that only gives you that 1% benefit. And so that's why they distort the data. It's a little bit like if you got a financial advisor that came in with 1% He's actually made 1% on your money last year, and this year he made 2% when the market's up 20%. And he says, in this fantastic, I doubled your return this year. Yeah, but you only made an extra 1% for me. So this is what they do to be able to promote the statins. And so understand what that 1% means. The 1% means that for every 100 people prescribed Lipitor, one out of that 100 people will have one less heart attack in five years. It's kind of like when that Clint Eastwood movie with Dirty Harry, when he says to him, you feel lucky, punk, you know? <laughs> well, do you feel lucky? You're the one taking the Lipitor. Are you gonna be the one out of 100 people that will have one less heart attack over five years? And that's really the Lipitor effect. And so if we put the real data and we have sort of truth in advertising, statins, they reduce your risk by 1%. And that's what the ad should look like, but they don't. Now, a more recent study, this is what's propelled Crestor to generate billions in revenue, is the Jupiter study published in 2008. 
And here's an article about it. The leader of the study, John Castelline, said, it's spectacular. We have actually prevented a first heart attack. It's breathtaking, Steve Nissen. It's a blockbuster. It's paradigm shifting. It's like, hey, this is like the most amazing thing ever. Go out and see this greatest movie. It's a blockbuster movie. Okay? Um, and so let's actually look at this study, the Jupiter study. And so the Jupiter study here is shown in this CME course. And so I look at the CME, even though I'm not a physician, I like to see about how physicians are educated. And so here in this course, in which you get credit for learning about Crestor benefits, and you can see the difference in incidence of coronary events. And you can see the placebo group has a much higher incidence of coronary events compared to Jupiter. And it's a 44% difference. That's really powerful. But this is not the way it should be shown. What you need to see are the real data, and you need to know more. So first of all, the Jupiter study was actually terminated at 1.9 years. Very few people are actually studied out here. The study ended here. And so the graph actually starts, and that is the 44% difference right here. Understand also the scale. The scale goes from 0 to 1.0. So if you were to actually put this entire graph on the screen, the top would be in the stratosphere somewhere. Understand that. And so you're looking at a microscopic part of this graph. So now brace yourself. I am going to show you, this is not my graph coming up, I'm going to show you the graph actually in the New England Journal of Medicine that shows the same data, but now in real form. This graph now out of the New England Journal of Medicine. The same data. These are actually two lines right here. And this is reported as a 44% difference because the effects are microscopic. And so what you can do is take a minuscule molehill, molehill and turn it into a huge revenue-generated mountain of bunk. And so here is the actual finding right out of the paper. It's almost like in magic. You know, magicians can write in front of you, deceive you, and that's what's happening here. We're being deceived. And this is what has generated billions for the drug companies selling Crestor. This idea of using what's called relative risk, which amplifies minuscule effects. The real problem is, you're looking at the incidence of adverse effects, the problem is almost nobody in Jupiter had a heart attack. Nobody died. And so they're taking microscopic effects, amplifying it by distorting the data. And I would like to remind you again what Steve Nissen said about this, a person who is very well funded by pharma. What did he say about this effect? Remember, breathtaking, blockbuster, absolutely paradigm shifting? I don't think so. All right, so I don't just present this in talks. I actually published this analysis a few years ago with Rufi Ravenskov. We published exactly what I'm telling you now, that high cholesterol is not atherogenic. In fact, you live longer. We talked about the relative risk as a form of deception, and the benefits of statins are offset by their adverse effects published in Expert Review of Clinical Pharmacology. And so one of the most profound adverse effects are, uh, is the development of diabetes. Now, you will typically hear that diabetes occurs at a very low rate. And that's because the drug companies supporting this work, they're not looking for diabetes. And if you're not looking for something, you're not going to find it. But here is a really nice study in which you actually start people off, and you take measures of A1C and you take their measures of fasting blood sugar, and you follow people for five to six years, and you find spontaneous development of type 2 diabetes in about 6% of the population, but you're looking at 11% of the people that are taking the statins now develop type 2 diabetes. These are healthy people, and you've added about 5% of them will now develop diabetes. And again, in that time, the benefit is only for 1% of the people to have one less heart attack. Now, what I have to tell you what's kind of cool is that I'm now seen as someone who is, has some expertise in the cardiovascular field. I've actually been invited to review papers on statins and to write commentaries. And so just recently, I was invited by Public Library of Science, the editor, to evaluate the statin research. And I wrote a commentary along with some outstanding clinician scientists, Michelle DeLargeril, Malcolm Kendrick, Ufi Ravenskopf, and Paul Rush. So we wrote this commentary, which is now in press in PLOS One. 
And this is probably the most comprehensive review of adverse effects of statins. We have dozens, over 60 papers. So this is from the peer-reviewed medical research, and you were looking at all the different adverse effects. Again, this is not, as Steve Nissen says, some internet cult. This is from peer-reviewed medical research showing significant increase in all these different adverse effects as a result of taking statins. So to prescribe a statin, to my opinion, to take a statin, for a doctor to prescribe a statin to a healthy person, in my view, is malpractice. You are increasing, thank you. You are increasing the likelihood that your patient will become ill as a result of taking the statins. And overall, you're not gonna live longer. This is a result of primary prevention. There is no improvement in mortality rate with statins, and it's little better in terms of secondary prevention. The effects of statins are minuscule, and if anything, it's only because statins have a slight anti-inflammatory and slight anticoagulant effect. It has nothing to do with the LDL lowering with the statins. So bring this now toward a close, then I'm saying it's not cholesterol that causes cardiovascular disease. Then what is it? Well, I want to show you another paper on familial hypercholesterolemia that sort of reinforces my point that these people are not inherently at risk of developing heart disease. This is an ancient study, but it's very useful because it was before the development of statins. So these people are not on medication that can effectively lower their cholesterol. So you see astronomically high total cholesterol, extremely high. This is recommended, you should be below 200. Their LDL is extremely high, you should be below 100, and here they are almost 250 but you've got equivalent lipids between two groups. The one in red, they have been diagnosed with heart disease, and the one in blue, they have no heart disease. And there is no difference in their lipids. So what is the difference between the groups? Clotting factors. Those people with familial hypercholesterolemia that develop heart disease have more clotting factors. FB is fibrinogen, factor eight, also clotting factors, two proteins involved in getting platelets to clump together. More clotting factors results in more heart disease. So a subset of people with FH have more active clotting factors, and it has nothing to do with LDL. It's kind of a game that God has played in which these people have all got high cholesterol, and some of them have got high clotting factors, and it's actually the clotting factors that can kill you. Here is another more recent study in which you actually look at people with FH, and again, no difference in LDL between those with heart disease and those that don't. Astronomically high LDL, but the difference is a subset of the people have a polymorphism, a form of the gene that increases clotting. And these people have more two and a half times the rate of heart disease than those with equivalent levels of LDL, but no heart disease. Again, it points to clotting factors. So we have just published a paper um, out in uh, Medical Hypotheses, directly attacking the idea that it's LDL in people with FH that causes cardiovascular disease, and it is not. Specifically, we have concluded that the individuals with FH who have premature cardiovascular disease, the point to look at, the factor is coagulopathy, excess clotting, as well as reduced fibrinolysis. That's the reduction of clots. And so the evidence is so clear. When you look at clotting, what you've got actually is a relation for both coronary heart disease and stroke, independent of age, increased fibrinogen levels, again, the protein that triggers clotting, increased fibrinogen levels independent of age is associated with more coronary heart disease as well as stroke, independent of cholesterol levels. And in fact, I'm working on a review now in which I'm looking at essentially all risk factors for coronary heart disease, as well as globally cardiovascular disease. And what you've got when you look around at all the risk factors, you see a mechanistic connection to increased clotting. So what you've got here are angry platelets that are clumping together. And so especially relevant to the work here is being obese, having metabolic syndrome, any increase in blood glucose triggers platelet aggregation. Having high triglycerides, which is very relevant to me, high triglycerides triggers greater platelet aggregation. And even LPA, which now is LP little a, what you've got actually is high LPA actually interferes with fibrinolysis. It's the opposite of clotting. You break down clots. 
So having high LPA interferes with the breaking down of clots because it mimics plasminogen activating factor and that's involved in breaking down clots. Okay, so to bring this to a close though, we are left with a problem. We still have this idea that LDL causes heart disease and the way LDL does it is it sort of seeps through this damaged endothelial lining of the artery, it then wreaks havoc inside the arterial wall. So this is the conventional wisdom as to how LDL causes heart disease. Well, here we actually have a cross-section of an individual relatively young in his 20s who died suddenly, but not of heart disease. And you can actually see that core of lipid inside his uh, artery wall, and it contains cholesterol and white blood cells and fibrin and pathogen remnants, so it's full of gunk. But, and the idea is that the LDL is somehow making it through, I call this the Trojan horse theory of atherosclerosis. The LDL is making its way through, this L, uh, through the endothelium. It finds its way into the core, leaving the endothelium relatively intact, and then it wreaks havoc. And then the LDL damages the inside of the wall. That's why God created LDL. So it to seep into the walls of our arteries and then wreak havoc and cause damage. Well, some LDL may very well get into the endothelium, but when you look at this endothelial lining in which there are layers and layers of plaque inside that accumulate over decades, somehow that LDL keeps getting through that damaged endothelium and then keeps wreaking havoc, and the endothelium keeps recovering and it looks relatively pristine. This frankly makes no sense to me if we're trying to understand how it is the plaque actually develops. So I found this paper of 1959, which I think is incredibly important, because they're talking about the development of atherosclerosis. And so they're talking about damage in the intima, the intima in the middle of the arterial wall. And they're talking about there's this deposition of fibrin, which is produced as a result of activation of fibrinogen after tissue injury. They're talking about injury in the middle of the arterial vessel, in the wall, not in the endothelium. And so how can you have injury in the middle of the wall without injury to the endothelium? Well, we get to what's called the vasovasorum. Vasovasorum is actually the, the, the layer, the coronary artery is so thick that it needs its own vasculature, a microvasculature that feeds the cells inside the wall. So you've got this microvasculature because the blood can't actually get right through this wall. You actually have to have additional vasculature to support the cells. These are microscopic blood vessels, perhaps even close to the side of, size of capillaries. And so this microvasculature actually feeds the inside of the arterial wall. And so there have been studies going back decades into the 1970s that link blockage of the vasovasorum resulting in hypoxia and necrosis in the middle of the arterial wall to the development of atherosclerosis. So here are some of the older studies, some of the more recent reviews, and an outstanding uh, review by Ravenskov and McCulley, 2009, on how it's blockage of the vasovasorum that ultimately causes atherosclerosis. It is damage from the middle. It is not LDL seeping into the endothelium. And here is a more recent review, very nice one from Subotin, in which he covers the same topic. The idea is here you've got a healthy um, coronary artery with the vas vasorum into the intima. These, uh, vas these blood vessels get blocked. Eventually then they have to grow into the other layers of the coronary artery. And with repeated blockage of the vasovasorum, you then have necrosis, the tissue dies. It then recovers, it is repaired, and with repeated blockage of the vasovasorum, that then grows, and the atheroma grows. So to summarize then, the hypothesis is that repeated blockage of the vasovasorum results in hypoxia, tissue necrosis and repair and growth of this plaque, which ultimately can block the coronary artery. And so the entire sequence is you go from elevated blood glucose, blood pressure and platelet aggregation, you block the vas vasorum, you then have hypoxia in the middle of the artery wall, tissue necrosis, you then have actually pathogens, bacteria can then invade this damaged tissue, and then you have inflammation. And at this point, you have white blood cells and LDL working together 
LDL is part of our immune system, and they kill the bacteria as well as remove viruses. The plaque formation is therefore the result of the repair. The intima then expands as a result of repeatedly having to repair the tissue. Ultimately, either you choke off the lumen, you have a heart attack, or that plaque ruptures, and that also results in a heart attack. This is the result, again, of repeated blockage of the vas vasorum, resulting in necrosis in the middle of the artery. It then is repaired with the cholesterol. Repeat this over time, you choke off the artery. So to bring this to a close, um, I did not take any medication 10 years ago. I'm very pleased, actually, that it's led me here today. I've learned that by going with low carb, I've reduced my triglycerides by 75%. I've increased my HDL by 25%, dramatically reducing my risk of developing heart disease. Um, so in, to, to bring this to a conclusion, there is no evidence that LDL-C or P in any form actually causes heart disease. LDL, in fact, is beneficial. It is a part of our immune system. It makes us healthier. Despite the praise from pharma-supported researchers, there are minuscule benefits of statins which are more than offset by the adverse effects. So the target for cardiovascular disease prevention should be hypercoagulation. And the ideal way to do that is with exercise and low-carb diet. And I want to acknowledge just the vast number of researchers that I've benefited by learning from. There's an outstanding book, in which I was fortunate to have a chapter with Ufi Ravenskov, Fat and Cholesterol Don't Cause Heart Attacks, and Statins Are Not the Solution. What an outstanding title. And so you've got so many researchers that have contributed to this book. I highly recommend it. And these are the people that I acknowledge that have helped me so much in my journey here today. I thank you for your attention. Thank <laughs> you.